The name is synonymous with San Francisco. The place is world famous. Its reputation, fearsome. A rock surrounded by nature, Alcatraz. The mere mention of the name stirs up legends and tales from bygone eras. A mystical home to evil native spirits. A pelican colony. A civil war fortress. And the most feared penitentiary in America. Throughout the ages, Alcatraz has stood as a silent sentinel, as a place to be avoided, and once there, escaping was the ultimate prize. I'm Mark Fuel, and today I'm taking you on a modern day adventure. Welcome to the 2014 Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon. And joining me on this escapade, five time escapee and multiple triathlon podium winner, Jenna Parker. Jenna, Alcatraz is as much an experience as it is a race. Absolutely, Mark. As an athlete, this race means battling against the elements, your competitors, and yourself. I'm really excited to be here as part of the commentary team this year. I've competed in triathlons all over the world and this event is iconic. It's the most honest race in the world. There's simply nowhere to hide out here. It exposes your weaknesses. It demands technical excellence in all three disciplines and requires intense focus from the moment the gun goes off until you cross the finish line exhausted. An exciting adventure awaits everyone out here today. An iconic race, 34 years old. To explain the course, Escape Academy's coach and 25-year race veteran, Eric Gilson. Currently, in most triathlons, you have way of starts and time to warm up. But not here at the Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon. 2,000 athletes jump off a perfectly good boat into the San Francisco Bay in eight minutes or less. 55 degree water meets the athletes along with a variety of marine life. You must immediately get into overdrive and swim across the virtual river that is the outgoing tidal currents leaving the bay at 5 million gallons a second. Alcatraz to the St. Francis Yacht Club, you've got strong currents, it's very choppy, a very challenging mile and a half swim. This is not the time to be mentally weak. Welcome to the world famous streets of San Francisco. The first two miles and the last two miles of this bike course are flat and fast. Other than that, the remaining 14 miles not only go past the world famous Golden Gate Bridge through the beautiful Presidio and out to the Golden Gate Park, but it also contains grueling and grinding uphills, roller coaster-like screaming downhills, throw in over a dozen left turns and a dozen right turns and this bike course even gives the most seasoned pro or age group triathlete a good challenging workout. This is a technical bike course to say the least. The run course on the Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon is eight miles, four miles out and four miles back. During the run, the athletes will go from sea level to 300 feet twice. There's also a variety of running surfaces out on course asphalt, loose gravel, dirt, sand, and that includes the sand ladder, 400 steps to get outside Baker Beach. With 2,000 athletes running, you can sometimes feel as though you're in a traffic jam. The course can be narrow in parts, and athletes need to use strategy in their maneuvers when deciding to attack or recover. It's flat, fast, hilly, and technical. The run course, it's got everything. It certainly does. Scenery, natural obstacles, and mental challenges. Jenna, you've stood on that railing. What's going through their minds? There's a lot of nervous excitement out there. Everyone's sort of wondering what the water's gonna hold for them today. All of the athletes, not just the pros, want to get off that boat and swimming as fast as possible because there are 2,000 people diving off the side of a boat in the matter of eight minutes. 
and it's not just the other athletes you've got to be aware of. As you can see, like lemmings off the side of the boat here into the frigid waters, these are challenging conditions. Absolutely. The water temperatures here range from 52 to 58 degrees depending on the year. It's not warm in there. And it may look calm from this position, but we can tell you that the wind is up and likely the chop is going to increase. That's absolutely right. And talking to Andy Potts earlier, we asked him a little bit, bit about the swim and where he heads because he's normally leading this race. And it was funny to hear him say that he has absolutely no idea what he's doing in this swim, even after winning five times. Cold, currents, winds, and wild sea life, it's also a little known fact that it's a major shark nursery. I'm race rookie, as you say, so I think this race is all about um, challenges and overcoming them and just, you know, you never really know what to expect and my goal is to go out there and just have a blast and to race hard and I think that that's what this race is all about. The race has certainly started to string out. We can see Andy Potts up front. Looks like he's followed closely by Josh Amberger. And then look, we've got a pink cap in there. That's Sarah McClarty, and she is taking advantage of the fact that this race starts with the men and women together. She's going to draft and tuck in there, which will give her a great advantage. Very well positioned. From the perspective of our swimmers, the shoreline seems to be like a mirage in the distance, but tactics are already coming into play. The athletes are approximately halfway into their 1.8 mile swim. By now, they've established a pace and ideally found some feet to draft behind. The cold temperature of the water, which was an initial shock diving off the boat, will make a return appearance now, along with plenty of chop forcing the athletes to focus on staying relaxed and keeping their stroke rate high. Sighting is extremely difficult with only the shoreline for guidance. So often the best thing to do is trust and follow the colored cap ahead. Now we move back into the pack and approaching the shoreline, this is where the excitement starts. Look at Sarah Haskins. She has done a fantastic job of getting herself back in this race on Sarah McClarty's feet. Whoa, look at that. It appears that the local spectator is giving these athletes a seal of approval. <laughs> well, as if Andy Potts needed any more encouragement. He is in the lead and he will be the first to hit the sand. Now, the effort changes from the upper body to the lower body. The legs must start moving. And when you stand up on that sand, it's really difficult because your feet feel like hooves. You can't feel your hands, you can't feel your feet, and you're just honestly trying not to fall on your face. And it is a long run up to transition. It is. These athletes have a choice to make when they get to the top. Do they take the wetsuit off? Do they put the shoes on? It's, it's a big decision point. Amberger from Australia, second out of the water. A big group behind them, including two pink caps, and that is the two Sarahs, Haskins and McClarty. But Amberger is looking strong. With the swim done, it's actually decision time again. Athletes can choose at this point to put shoes on to help them run that half mile on the hard pavement. It's a very challenging surface. There's rocks, there's little boulders, and now we see a big group coming out of the water. John Bird from Canada right there and our lead woman. There's Sarah McClarty. She's done it again. She often leads out of the water, but the great thing right behind her is Sarah Haskins. Very well positioned. As you can see, all our leaders choosing not to put shoes on. There we can see the rocky surface they start. There's Sarah Haskins. She is charging through this transition area. Andy Potts out in front, heading towards the transition. This is a long run, about 600 metres. Bevan Doherty is not far behind him. Andy's clearly done this before, and he's chosen to actually wear his wetsuit for most of this run, which helps to warm his body up after that cold swim. It is very cool this morning. Now onto the wet grass, straight to the bike transition, and this is a critical point in time. Transition can make or break you. You can lose 30 seconds if you don't know what you're doing here. He is such an expert. That was so smooth. Andy Potts out onto the bike leg now, and this is a 
very familiar position for him. Amberger now, the young Australian, into transition, battling with his wetsuit. Yes, but he's very quick at this. Racing short course helps him to get in and out fast because, look, he's got people breathing down his neck. John Bird, Bevan Doherty and Graham O'Grady all into transition together. Ahead of them, a very technical, very hilly 18-mile cycle ride. It's short by normal distances, but you cannot afford a lapse in concentration. You can't. John Bird just had a fantastic transition. He's already out on his bike. First woman in transition, Sarah Haskins. This is the first time that Sarah has raced at Alcatraz, and you can see she's struggling a little bit there to get her helmet on. It's probably because her hands are numb, but what's wonderful about her is that she's remaining calm. She tried again, and she's staying focused on what she needs to do to get out on her bike. And she still has a considerable lead. Matt Reed. He is a very powerful cyclist. He's won here before. Look for him to do something big on the bike. And let's take a look at the split times for the swim. Potts, Amberger and O'Grady out in front. Any surprises there, Jenna? I'm surprised to not see Matt Reed on this list. You know, he's normally a strong swimmer. He's going to have some work to do on that bike. And in the women's field, McClarty and Haskins both under 30 minutes. There's no surprise here, but Haskins has certainly set herself up for a great race. It's a shorter bike than normal, being 18 miles. Uh, it's very hilly, so you need to, you know, pay attention to how much effort you're exerting on the hills, and and uh, you know whether you're not putting enough effort on the downhills. Um, you know, you can lose a lot of time if you you overdo the hills and, and kind of blow up at the end of the bike. You know, it's a, it's a it's a course where it's it's challenging enough where if you exert yourself too much, you can really uh, put yourself in the hurt locker. One man managing the pain very well is our leader, Andy Potts. And Jenna, we're getting close to the first hill. The athletes are lucky that the first part of this bike, it's two miles flat. That gives them a chance to get the blood back into their legs before they hit these climbs. Well, this is the first climb right here. And Andy Potts, the first obstacle to his sixth victory. He looks good going up this first hill. He's on top of his gears and he's riding strong. Amberger, the Australian, chasing hard, flat and fast along this course. Here but comes look at Doherty. this. Doherty. Look, Doherty's got Bird right in front of him, and you can see Amberger just up the way. Amberger now attacks the hill. He knows that people are chasing him. He wants to get some distance. He knows that Bevan Doherty is an Olympic medalist, and he is not going to give up. He's already moved into third position. Now, Bird in fourth. Doherty is a fantastic biker, and he knows if he wants to win here, he's got to close down the gap to Potts. Potts is now on top of the Presidio Hill and about to hit his first descent. The descents here are very tricky. They're windy, there's some wind. It's super important that the athletes attack them but know what's coming. And now our lead female. Haskins on the climb, looking very smooth. She's looking really good right now. She's got to feel confident knowing that she's already in the lead and she's got a gap back to McClarty. This is one of the most famous races in the country by far, and so I'm so happy to be able to, to fit in my schedule and to be able to participate in this race. Um, you know, they're Ironman world champion Miranda, two-time Olympian Laura. So there's great girls. I think having great competition brings out the best in everyone. Up into the exclusive San Francisco suburb of Seacliff, but no time for these athletes to house hunt here, Jenna. Nope, you can see that Doherty has already made the pass on Amberger. He's a man on a mission. He's never won here, and I know he wants to. And he is such an aggressive racer, a two-time Olympic medalist. You can see Amberger just trying to hang on. If Amberger can use Doherty to pace himself, he will have a fantastic ride. Potts is out of the saddle. He is climbing up to the highest point on this entire bike course, 300 feet above sea level as he approaches the Legion of Honor. 
He's still looking strong. He's on top of his pedal stroke. He's alternating between sitting and standing, which changes the muscle groups that he's using. Pot's in familiar territory. He loves to race from the front. Haskins loves to race from the front too, but she's never raced here before. She's looking really strong though. See how she's down in her arrow bars? That's a really good sign. And Doherty continues his aggressive chase. Amberger is losing time with every pedal stroke because Doherty is a man who wants to win. It is a very iconic event, um, you know, whether you're a pro or an age grouper, it's, um, it's always on everybody's sort of hit list. So, uh, you know, I've, I'm excited to race here. Uh, it's very unique, obviously, jumping off the boat to the freezing cold water, um, swimming from Alcatraz, um, and, and then riding and running up around the Golden Gate. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a special event and uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. So you, you feel like you've really accomplished something and enjoyed the sport as well. And as much as he is here for the experience, don't be fooled, this man is hungry for a victory here. The turn for home at mile nine in Golden Gate Park is not the time to ease up. It's actually when the real work begins. What was a steep technical descent down past Lincoln Park and Point Lobos now becomes a series of unforgiving climbs. Athletes need to stay focused and mentally prepared to attack the hills ahead. Those competitors who manage their energy well in the first half will find themselves able to make up a lot of time on the way home. The hilly course makes this race difficult for more than one reason. With the terrain constantly changing, it makes it challenging to take on fuel. However, those racers who make eating and drinking a priority will set themselves up for a great run. While not flat, this section of the course through Golden Gate Park is one of the easiest places to take on fuel. And it's such a beautiful part of the course cycling up here through Golden Gate Park. It looks like it's steady, but this hill climb still hurts the legs. It really does take it out of your legs. And when you're racing here, you almost don't realize that you're climbing, which makes it even more difficult. Amberger is chasing. He's trying to keep Bevan Doherty in his sights because once you lose vision of the person in front of you, it's hard to stay focused. Out of sight, out of mind. And Andy Potts right now taking on fuel is just focused dead ahead. He knows he's got to get to that run course. Potts is used to this position, leading from start to finish. John Bird, he had a great swim. He's lost a little bit of time, but he is still well placed in the top part of this field. The Canadian, still strong. Here we are back with Sarah Haskins. She is still in her arrow bars as she makes this gradual climb. She looks fantastic on top of her cadence. She's been in the lead all day. An aerodynamic position, maintaining it throughout and conserving her energy. Now the sweeping turn back alongside the Pacific Ocean and heading towards home. Andy and Sarah have both been out front all day and mentally as a competitor, that can be difficult. You can see there the only thing that Andy Potts has to focus on is the lead vehicle up in front. He hasn't looked behind him once. He has no idea where his competitors are. Now coming out onto the Pacific coast is Bevan Doherty and he doesn't quite have Potts in his sight but he knows he is up ahead. Potts now is on the climb. This is where the effort really starts to come in. This is a really steep part of the course. You can see him grinding away to get up there. Brian Fleischmann is having a spectacular ride. He has moved past Bird. Sarah McClarty making the turn for home in Golden Gate Park. She's riding very well today, but right behind her, we see Ricarda Lisk from Germany and Radka Vodakova from the Czech Republic. They are chasing hard. And with a bigger group, it's quite possible that they will spur each other on to chase this woman down who's got a considerable lead, but she is now the hunted on the course. Sarah Haskins likes to be hunted. She races well when she's out front. You can see she's comfortable. She's on top of her gears. She is riding really strong. She's flying down this course. And Bevan Doherty not flying quite at the same speed because he is climbing up this long hill, choosing to stay in the saddle. 
staying seated is actually a really good thing to do sometimes. If you switch between sitting and standing, you're actually changing up the muscle groups you're using when you're riding, which will save something for that run. And the last thing you want is your heart rate to go absolutely above into the red line because they've still got a lot of this adventurous course ahead of them. Bevan Doherty would be feeling that lactic acid burn right now coming up the hill. His legs would be on fire. Now onto the descent. This is very important both to recover from that lactic acid buildup and also the skill set here is critical. Bevan will want to keep his legs moving a bit as he goes through this downhill just to flush that lactic acid out a bit. But, you know, we're going to see a textbook lesson on how to descend right here. He's a fantastic bike handler. And he has incredible confidence. You cannot afford to have any fear as you attack these descents. The roads are not made for cycling. They're not smooth. They're not even. And yet here we see Bevan Doherty attacking this course. The motorbike can't even keep up with him. Back to Andy. He is making his way up the final climb of the day. Once he reaches the top of this climb, he's heading home, heading downhill, and he's thinking about the hard run to come. Yes, it's a very challenging eight mile run, but he still has to maintain this pace because mere seconds can mean the difference between a win and a loss. Look at this out of the saddle now, powering. This is our women's leader, Sarah Haskins. Now we're seeing the effort. At this point in the course, she's laid a lot on the line and not knowing how to race here may have taken a toll on her. Chasing down the hill for the final time, this is Andy Potts, our race leader. Underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, he will then continue to descend down beside the Presidio. And it's a good thing there are no police around because the speed limit here is normally 25 miles an hour. He is doing more than double it, over 50 miles per hour. He is flying, but the flats are very close, but he has to stay focused. He has to make sure he makes it down in one piece. He has, he's on the flats now. How does he prepare for the final leg of this adventure? As you'll see here, Andy's keeping his cadence really high. That's gonna help keep flushing that blood and that lactic acid out of his legs, which will prepare him for the grueling eight mile run that's ahead. And it's not just physical preparation, it's also mental. Andy can finally start thinking about all of the obstacles that lay ahead. He's been on the bike for 47 minutes. Now he has to prepare himself for the run. Jenna, seconds are vital here. Seconds are vital. This is the equivalent to the triathlon pit stop. He's going to get his shoes on, his helmet off, and he wants to be out on the run as fast as possible and different muscles will be used here. You can see Andy, his feet are probably very cold because of that last ascent. The helmet comes off, he has his gear and he is off. Meanwhile, back on the bike course, our lead woman, Haskins, still in front. She's still in front and she's nearing the top of her final climb. She's gotta be happy that she's out in the lead and she's almost home. Well, in such familiar territory, she is a rookie here. She's never done it before. She has scorched this bike course, and we know she's a good runner. Bevan Dockery back into transition now. He's had a fantastic ride. He'd be happy with that. Can I feel my toes? Well, his feet may be numb, but he closed the gap. Now, only 50 seconds behind Andy Potts. He's well within striking distance. This race will go down to the wire. Andy looks really smooth running out of transition. He's got a good cadence going, and he's focused ahead. Now, into transition, Amberger. He has held his position quite well. He'll be looking for a fast transition. It looks like he's stumbling just a little bit here. I wonder if his feet are a little bit cold as well. Well, we know that the water was freezing cold. They were then out on the cycle for between 45 and 50 minutes. He is off and running. Doherty is ahead of him. Doherty is now hunting for his first win here at Escape from Alcatraz. Look how light he is on his feet. 
It takes years of racing to make running look that effortless. Smooth and controlled, but Amberger is also a very good runner. You can see here, straight into his stride. It's all about the cadence and making sure that you pace yourself at the start of this very difficult run. Oh, here we have Brian Fleischmann. He's in fourth position now. He had a tremendous ride. Fleischmann has had great performances here at Escape from Alcatraz as well as over in Beijing. And this man knows the course very, very well. A good transition and he will streak out O'Grady coming in behind him. The New Zealander who was second here last year off the bike and he will also, he's dropped his shoe. That's no good. He's going to want to pick that up, otherwise he could incur a time penalty. The rules are very strictly enforced here in Tri-Power. Matt Reed, he didn't have a great swim, but that's a very good ride. That's a great ride for Matt. He's put himself back in this race. John Bird is right there with him. The two tallest pros in this field, both of them six foot five, but Matt Reed is a previous champion. There is a lot of pride at stake. Haskins now back into transition. She may be a rookie here, but she's showing us that experience may not matter. Well, with over 30 wins on her resume, she is a force to reckon with. Where do we run now? Which yeah, way? Where do I run, run now? That way. This way? Yeah. Maybe experience does matter. The bike splits. Bevan Doherty with the quickest time. Reed and Fleischmann setting up a great battle. They have gone head to head on the run many times. Not surprising, Sarah Haskins with the fastest split of the day. But Marinda Carfrey hasn't lost any time to Haskins here on the bike. Even though she's three minutes down, don't count this Aussie pocket rocket out. Andy Potts leading the field into the beginning of this eight mile run and it is grueling the terrain varies and this is yet another challenge that they will face this race jenna is by no means over it's not here you can see andy's out on the flat section of the course he's got about two miles of gravelly sand to run through and here we see Bevan Doherty. We know he's a great runner. He was a 2004 world champion, but he's been training for long course. Does he have the speed? The beautiful thing about this course is that speed is important, but so is strength. And what about the terrain here, Jenna? Because it is so unusual. If you head out too fast on this flat section and you get your heart rate up too high, when you hit that first set of stairs, you're going to be in big trouble. And Josh Amberger is approaching those stairs now. Potts right at the base of them. Once again, he is going to be going uphill for about the 30th time today. He can't be too happy about this, but Potts knows these stairs better than anybody else. And if you think that he's won here five times, what is it about him as an athlete that suits this course so well? Potts is really level-headed. He's really good about staying in the moment and not getting flustered. And he knows how to pace this course properly. Bevan also looking very comfortable, light on his feet, very smooth. The shoulders are relaxed and dancing up the stairs here. He knows that he is close. He's now down to about 45 seconds. The gap is closing. Now up on top above the Golden Gate Bridge, this is the leader, Andy Potts, looking strong. He is absolutely powering along this course, determined to set history. At this point, Andy's going to start the descent down to Baker Beach. This will be a moment when he can take a few deep breaths, try to relax a little bit, maybe shake out his legs and prepare for what's ahead. Now, Jenna, while you do get to catch your breath and you can drop your heart rate when you're running downhill, they can be very hard on the legs. You can see Bevan's legs, his quad muscles are firing. He's using a lot of braking forces as he's running downhill. It can take a lot out of your legs. Our women's race leader, Sarah Haskins, looks up and sees the first set of stairs ahead of her. It's incredible to think that less than a year ago, she was having a first baby. It really is. To juggle that, to be able to train, and to be out there leading this race is truly impressive. And what an amazing performance here by Ricarda Lisk. A fantastic bike ride and looking smooth on the run. 
Ricardo's been incredibly consistent all day. She had a great swim. She just moved her way up on the bike, and she has set herself up to be on the podium. Meanwhile, Haskins is mowing down more <laughs> of the men in this field, but you can see she is putting in a lot of effort. Down on Baker Beach, our men's race leader, Andy Potts, is making very quick and light work of running through the sand, which is really difficult. Yeah, it looks like it's flat, but where you've got the shifting sand, it's soft in places. Now, for the first time since the race started, the athletes will see each other eye to eye. This can be a critical moment because if Bevan looks at Andy and sees a shred of weakness, it could just inflate him and push him on to be able to chase him down. You can tell now the exact distance between them. The perspective now, they're virtually side by side. Interestingly, Andy Potts moving away from Doherty. At the base of the daunting 400 step sand ladder, it's decision time. How do you tackle 400 sand stairs? For the pros, how they manage these stairs can be the difference in winning or losing the race. History shows the first athlete reaching the top almost always proves the victor at the end of the day. Halfway up, both of your legs are screaming. The top cannot come fast enough. Pacing well and finding a good rhythm may resemble more of a walk than a run. Some athletes also choose to use the cables to pull themselves up. Now is no time to give in. There's still half a ladder to go. Here at the top of the stairs, it's not time to relax and take in the beautiful scenery just yet. Athletes must stay focused because the sand doesn't stop and there's one last uphill climb before the final descent back down to Chrissy Field and the finish line the 2,000 competitors have been seeking all day. From the top of the sand ladder, there are three more miles to go for Josh Amberger at the base of the climb here. The hard work is ahead of him. We just watched Andy take a more slow and calculated route up. We watched Bevan dance up, and here we see Josh grabbing and pulling at the cables to help himself up. It really gives an indication of how important technique is to getting up these stairs. It's almost like Amberger is pulling himself off balance. Andy Potts at the top of the sand ladder. You can see he's struggling to sort of get his footing and get his stride going again. But there are two very positive things here, Mark. First is that his split time was 152, which is very strong. And the second is he's the first man to the top. First woman to the top here is our female race leader, Sarah Haskins, is still flying along this course, the downhill just ahead. Here she goes, now the pressure on the legs, they'll be screaming at her. They will, and Sarah's not really used to running downhill this much because most races don't require that. And there's a storm brewing from behind, that was Lisk, but this woman, the Iron Man champion, is flying on this course. Marinda Carfrey has made up some serious time. She is on a mission. She has now put herself on the podium, but she's not going to stop there. Good job, Andy. Potts almost has a whiff of the finish line here. You can see a slight downhill. You can also see all of the other competitors on this spectacular course here in San Francisco. And it's not just the terrain you have to deal with at this stage, it's all the other people on the course with you. As the lead men approach the descent down that first set of stairs, they are gonna be met with a bunch of age groupers climbing up. And now at the turning point, down onto the beach, Haskins doesn't take on any water. She's focused, she's looking straight ahead. Will she see any of her competitors? Haskins has no one behind her. She has no one to look at on that beach. But she still has to make it up the sand ladder. And we have seen it before. It has broken down some of the best athletes in the world. Even with as big a lead as this, you can still lose. That's right, Mark. She can't afford to make any big mistakes here. She's probably heard a lot about the ladder, but she's never tackled it herself. Oh, you can see here she's struggling to find a rhythm. She's trying to use the cables to pull herself up, but she looks like she's pretty tired. 
virtually came to a complete standstill. She's trying to get a rhythm going. She has her head down, focused on those stairs. Be oh, and a stumble there. This is the danger part of this course. You have to get up at the top. You have to control your heart rate, and you have to be in one piece. Sarah's staying really focused and staying calm like she has been all day is going to be what keeps her in the lead. But you can tell how much that hurt her now. She's trying to get her rhythm back, but look at Lisk. Lisk is charging, and right behind her, Marinda Carfrey is scorching this course. Carfrey doesn't even look like she's working. She is flying across that sand, and she has a target on Lisk's back, and you know she's going to chase after her hard. Well, this is going to be a surprise for Lisk because Carfrey has been nowhere during the swim. She held her own on the bike, but it's all down to the run. Now Lisk, she's been here before. She knows what's ahead of her. Ricarda has tackled these stairs many times, and she finished really well here last year. She's got experience on her side, as Carfrey hasn't raced here since 2006, I believe? It has been quite a few years. It was back in 2008, but she's a very different athlete here. Focused on Lisk right now, does it matter the different statures? Obviously, Ricarda, tall and lean, and you've got Marinda, who's very powerful. Having a lower center of gravity may very well help her here because it keeps her more balanced and she's less likely to lose her footing. Ricarda's advantage would be on the downhills because of her long legs. Go, Andy! The long legs of Andy Potts taking two stairs at a time, almost down onto the final flat section of this course, just two miles to go, but the race is not over yet. Bevan still looks really good as he's heading towards that same set of stairs. And here's Josh. His cadence seems to have dropped a little bit, but he's still in really good position and could still hold on to that third place finish. A rising star of Australian triathlon now on the global stage. He's relaxed, his eyes are up, he's looking forward and he's keeping his pace and momentum. But this man now has the finish line almost in sight. Here is Sarah Haskins. She is still in the lead. She is still pushing hard, but she has to know that somewhere close behind is Marinda Carfrey. The question, Jenna, is, is she running scared? Sarah is used to being in front. She is used to being the hunted. And Marinda Carfrey is used to being the hunter. They like it that way. And look at this man coming in to the finish shoot for the sixth time in history as the winner. He had to push from start to finish, and he is a very happy boy. He's out of Colorado Springs in Colorado. Two hours three, coming up on two hours four on the race clock right now. Andy Potts! That's a happy boy! Six times for Andy Potts! A celebration to remember. More wins here at Escape from Alcatraz than any other male athlete in history. But what a great performance by Bevan Doherty. Bevan had a stellar race today. He came out here from the start. He was on fire all day, and he just came up a little short in the end. Bevan Doherty and Andy Potts, two of the greatest triathletes of the modern era. Now, Sarah Haskins still in the lead. But look at what is coming, storming from behind. This is the Australian, and she is charging out of control from one hard-charging Australian to the other, Amberger, a solid third. A great day for Josh. He should be really proud of himself to come out here racing against some of the big guns, proving that he's got what it takes. All smiles here at the finish line. Now, both athletes are in the finish shoot together. Look at Carfrey. She is in full gear. And she's going to win it. Two hours, 18, with a little pressure.
pressure in second from the pocket rocket. Look at that. Sarah Haskins. Haskins takes the win her first time at Alcatraz and she takes victory. But what a performance there by Marinda Carfrey. Three minutes down, going into the run, she got within 10 seconds. And what an incredible performance by Ricarda Lisk of Germany. All smiles and she should celebrate. It was a great performance by her. As soon as the horn blew, um, I knew we were getting the, the wind from the Pacific pushing inland. And so that dictated how you can breathe in the water. And so I tried to breathe to my right on my way uh, sighting. And it was just like, here's a mouthful of bay water. Here's another mouthful of bay water. So I basically spent the whole time breathing to my left, um, got some early distance in the swim and really kind of tried to push my advantage as best as possible. I was fortunate and uh, my training paid off and I'm super, super happy. The backdrop of San Francisco, you know, jumping off the boat, you know, getting the the iconic swim, the hills of the of San Francisco. I think that it parcel this race parcels out each discipline equally, and so it, I really gravitate towards that. And uh, you usually see the person who can put all three sports together the best excel. There's no other race like this. I'd say it's an iconic race with the start. Um, you know happen over the railing. I thought Sarah McClarty was joking when she was mentioning we had to do that. But um, no, in, in, in reality, you know, it was um, tough. I was not expecting so much downhill running on, on the run. I'm not, I'm not used to that. So that's something I would need to improve upon coming back to the next escape. How did you handle the swim course? Because there's no buoys. And I know in most of the races that you do, you've got buoys to sight on. There's probably a, a lot less chop in the water. How did you handle that today? Yeah, I mean, I've done tough ocean swims before, so I was familiar with that. Fortunately, we started men and women together, so I was fortunate to be behind Andy Potts and, and, and Sarah McCarty and kind of just look at caps and swimmers and, and trust them. I think the most difficult part for me, um, not physical-wise, but mental-wise, was just going downhill and kind of looking for people, looking for rocks. I was surprised. I think the sand ladder, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's so hard, the sand ladder, the sand ladder. I think I expected it to be harder than it was. So I was pleasantly surprised to not feel, um, you know, burning legs when I got up to the top. The final standings. Firstly, to the men, Andy Potts of the USA out in front. Bevan Doherty just 38 seconds behind. A very strong performance in third by Josh Amberger from Australia. Graham O'Grady of New Zealand in fourth. Brian Fleischman of the US in fifth. And John Bird from Canada in sixth place. For the women, a commanding performance from the gun by American Sarah Haskins, finishing in 2.17.42. Close behind her in second, Australian Marinda Carfrey with one of the fastest run splits we've ever seen here at the Escape from Alcatraz. And in fifth, four-time winner Leanda Cave showing us just how fast it was out there today. The Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon in 2014 has been run and won. A special thanks to the city and county of San Francisco, San Francisco Recreation Parks, the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District, Golden Gate National Recreation Area and the Presidio Trust. Two worthy winners taking home the spoils, Andy Potts and Sarah Haskins. On behalf of Jenna Parker, I'm Mark Fuel. It's been great to have your company today on this epic adventure. And we look forward to seeing you next year as once again, we escape from Alcatraz.